Skywalker, literally meaning one who walks the sky, is one of the most iconic surnames in all of fiction. Having been chosen by the Force as vessels to realign the universe's destiny, Skywalkers have played pivotal roles in the Star Wars narrative since the franchise began in 1977, with their in-universe deeds spanning at least two centuries worth of galactic history. The family has amassed many legendary and powerful members over the years, and not a single one of them is truly weak in either body or spirit. In today's video, we will be ranking the various members of the fabled Skywalker family from weakest to strongest in order to parse out just how OP these people truly are. However, before we go over the list, I need to establish disclaimers as there are many. Unlike my previous ranking videos that followed a linear numerical system, I'm going to be using a tier classification system for this one since the power scaling of the Skywalker clan is much less direct than what can be observed from the various Battlemasters or the Grandmasters. As always, this video will be based exclusively on the known Skywalkers of the Legends continuity, meaning that Bloodborns like Ben Solo or adoptees like Rey Skywalker will not be factored in. While we're on the subject of relational status, I will be focusing mainly on scaling the Force-sensitive Skywalkers who are directly related to Anakin by blood, no clones, rather than those affiliated with his line via marriage, adoption, life debt, or house relative. That said, I will be making brief references to where characters like Mara Jade Skywalker or the Legacy Era Fells would rank on the list as they come for the sake of clarification. For those curious about how I would scale some of the indirectly related Skywalkers, I will quickly do so now. At the bottom, I have Anna, Skeeto, and Micah Rock. Above them, I have their aged mother, Drew Rock. Above her, I have Baru Lars. Then I have Owen Lars. After him, I have Clone Wars Padme Amidala, fully equipped. Then end of series Anaya Solo, fully equipped. Then Prime Han Solo, fully equipped, no Millennium Falcon. Then NJO Chewbacca. Then end of series Princess Mara Saya Fell. Then end of series Emperor Roan Fell. And finally, at the top, I have Prime Mara Jade Skywalker. I doubt there's going to be too much contention there. Last but not least, I want to make it as clear as possible that while many of these Skywalkers were either killed or erased by Disney before reaching the peaks of their power, I will be examining them based purely on how they are presented in the story rather than what they could have been. That said, I will reference where their hypothetical peaks could go when and where I deem appropriate. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Starting in H tier is Shmi Skywalker, the biological progenitor of the main Skywalker family line. Now, I know many of you are probably a little perplexed to see Shmi here, considering my opening statements about keeping this list strictly Force-sensitive, but roll with me for a second. Not only does it make sense narratively for the Force to choose a forceful being to carry its chosen one, but Shmi is actually implied to possess a small connection to the Force by the Episode 1 Visual Dictionary, which states that she can always sense when Anakin is nearby even when she cannot see or hear him. While you could maybe write this off as Shmi having a powerful motherly intuition, it seems odd that the book would specify her ability to sense her son without needing to see or hear him, without there being some deeper meaning to it. This isn't all that far-fetched considering that beings with remote connections to the Force are still known to exhibit an advanced level of awareness of those they hold dear. I also think it's worth pointing out that Shmi had mental fortitude enough to endure an entire month's worth of torture at the hands of the Tusken Raiders, which isn't unimpressive considering she was around 50 years old at the time. That said, I think it's pretty apparent why Shmi Skywalker is ranked at the bottom, as she literally has nothing going for her beyond an implied weak sensitivity, and that one durability feat which itself is nothing compared to what we see others of her line go through in the future. Still though, not worth ignoring. Next in G tier, we have prophesied Alana Solo and all the other feetless Skywalkers who lived during the time skip between the Fate of the Jedi novels and the Legacy comic book series. 
I've stated in a past community post that I think it makes the most sense for there to have been a two-generational divide between Ben Skywalker and Nat and Cole Skywalker given their implied ages, but that's obviously just my personal headcanon. We know next to nothing about who these Skywalkers were, much less what they were capable of combatively. The only reason I put them above Shmi is that they were most likely trained as Jedi, and I think we can all agree that even your most basic Padawan is more than sufficiently equipped to handle her. Not much else to say, so let's just move on. Next in F tier, we have the Jedi Knight Anakin Solo and his younger cousin, the Jedi Knight Ben Skywalker. Despite their almost diametrically opposing characterizations, Anakin and Ben share a number of equivalencies in both narrative and combative portrayal, which is why I don't personally view one as inherently superior to the other. In terms of potential, Anakin Solo is confirmed by the new essential guide to characters to have possessed a more profound connection to the Force than either of his older siblings, Jason and Jaina. Darth Kytus, meanwhile, has stated outright that Ben Skywalker could grow strong enough to kill him with time and training, implying that the Dark Lord believed that his cousin's latent power surpassed even his own. All that being said, the reason I place Anakin and Ben beneath the twins and the majority of their clan is that neither of them was ever depicted in their primes having fallen victim to the premature death and Disney erasure syndromes I mentioned previously. Anakin's scaling is only in relation to much weaker versions of his peers, and although Kytus was wary of Ben's potential, he still viewed him as a non-threat during the events of Legacy of the Force. We even see that play out when the young man's attempt to assassinate his dark cousin is met with failure. That said, neither Skywalker is without their impressive showings. During the Yuzhan Vong War, Anakin would participate in numerous sparring matches with Jason where the two would trade wins and losses. These bouts were considered impressive by both NJO Mara and Luke, and even by the final book in the series, Jason still considered his younger brother to have been the superior fighter. Jason at this point being stronger than Jaina by the measure of the Vong Slayers. Even if you want to write this concession off as Jason being humble, it is irrefutable that the brothers were relative during the story arc, placing Anakin Solo well beyond your rank-and-file Jedi Knight. In the years following his cousin's sacrifice, Ben Skywalker would display some of the most insane power creep in the entire franchise, going from being a borderline initiate-level fighter unable to force Jaina to even activate her lightsaber, to a fully-fledged Jedi capable of standing his ground against Sith apprentice Tahiri Vela in the span of a single year. While Ben does state that Tahiri was conflicted and deliberately not trying to kill him, the fact that he was able to stand up to her in any capacity is extremely impressive. Tahiri was a fully trained knight of not inconsiderable status who was capable of briefly holding out against a mentally unbalanced Leia Organa solo. Not only that, but as mentioned, this was Tahiri after her training under Darth Kytus. Further adding to Ben's knight level status was his ability to comfortably engage a force psychosis addled Valen Horn, whom Luke stated was a threat to his son specifically because of his greater experience. No mention of greater power to be found. Ben's prowess would even earn him praise from the powerful Sith Saber Gaver Kai, who, while clearly not in any serious danger of dying, rated the young man highly enough to try and convert him to the dark side of the Force in the midst of their battle. This tier is where I believe Princess Mara Saya Fel could go as well, as while she is clearly above your average Imperial Knight, basic one Sith warriors have consistently given her some pushback, and she was literally one-shotted by her father during the Battle of Coruscant, so it's unlikely she'd give any major council masters a run for their credits. In E tier, we have the Jedi Knight, Leia Organa Solo. This is like, wait, Leia above Anakin and Ben? 
Excuse me, Evan, are you forgetting how Jason was depicted to be stronger than Leia during Balance Point, a period where he's relative to Anakin? Are you also forgetting how Kytus dismissed his mother as an equal non-threat to himself as Ben was? Yes, both of these statements are true. However, there are two factors we need to consider. First, the Jason and Leia Anakin Solo scales too are much weaker than they would later become, so we can't use that as concrete reference material. Similarly to what Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi went through during the Clone Wars, author Troy Denning has confirmed that the NJO Jedi's experiences during the Vong invasion pushed all of the survivors to grow much stronger than they ever would have otherwise. Secondly, while I agree with Kytus that Leia and Ben are equivalent in raw combative ability, the reason I place her and Iota above him comes down to experience, which unlike Valen, she can actually back up with power, as well as just having a better overall standing in the lore. Potential-wise, Leia Solo has been noted on many occasions to possess an equal level of aptitude as her twin brother Luke Skywalker. The only difference is that she never trained enough to bring that potential to the surface, ending up considerably weaker as a result. While some have used Master Kip Duran's statement of Leia being just as strong in the Force as he is in the unifying Force to argue that she is near equal to Vong-era Luke, this was clearly referencing the amount of power she could potentially wield rather than her typical level of ability. I'll get into hypothetical full potential Leia later on, but as it stands, she is outright stated to be weaker than her master Saba Sebatine, who herself is relative to council masters like Kyle Katarn, Corin Horn, and Kent Hamner. That said, Leia Organa Solo still had a much better performance against Tahiri than Ben did, coming within a hair's breadth of killing the traitorous Jedi before Han interfered, whereas Ben could barely hold his ground. Even if we concede that the Tahiri Leia fought was a bit weaker than the one who faced Ben, Leia was emotionally unbalanced at the time of her fight and still managed to hold the edge. Add this to the fact that Tahiri was conflicted when Ben confronted her, and I see little reason to assume that the dynamic would change if you swapped the characters around. If that wasn't proof enough, Leia dominated the high-tier Sith Saber Quardian Dai, whereas, again, the best Ben could do against Gaver Kai was trade blows. Overall, while Leia Organa Solo's superiority over Anakin and Ben is based primarily on technicalities, the lore speaks for itself. This tier is where I think Emperor Roan Fell would go, as he is portrayed as being much stronger than many of his Imperial Knights, including his daughter, yet was still ultimately slain by a Jedi Master level and Taurus Draco. Occupying D tier, we have the Jedi Master Nat Skywalker, also known as Bantha Rock after he temporarily departed from the Order. Now, Nat's scaling is much like those in F and E tier, considering we've never seen what he can do in his prime. However, this is the only instance where you could rank post-prime and prime Nat in the same tier, for reasons I will explain shortly. The man is a fully realized Jedi Master, which automatically puts him above Anakin and Ben. He is also portrayed as having an equal standing to members of the NJO Jedi Council, a class of fighters Leia is shown to be consistently beneath. I actually wouldn't be surprised if it turned out Nat had been on the Council during his heyday, considering how knowledgeable he seems to be of the Jedi's political workings. As to why I place post-Prime and Prime Nat in D tier, the old Bantha states in Legacy Issue 24 that his younger brother Cole understood the Force in ways he never could. The term never could is of particular importance here, since it confirms that Cole's superiority over his big bro was more or less a constant throughout their entire Jedi careers. Cade Skywalker is also shown killing Nat in a Force vision, though this is of course implicit. Regarding showings, even as an old man, Nat Skywalker still holds a highly impressive record. Shortly after the Empire's attack on Dak, Nat easily overpowered the fully trained Imperial Knight Aslan Ray, despite not being armed. Sometime later, Nat would showcase his true combative abilities when the One Sith launched an all-out assault on the Jedi's hidden temple. Many dark warriors fell to the old Bantha's blade that day, 
including various members of Darth Krayt's Sith Troopers. As noted by Darth Krayt himself, the Sith Troopers were culled from those who displayed the strongest levels of Force sensitivity upon birth and were henceforth augmented by the most advanced cybernetics, essentially turning them into Sith-style super cyborgs. Try saying that five times fast. Despite such opposition, Nat Skywalker was able to hold back and kill several of these dark side elites before a suicide crash into the temple's council chamber finally ended his life. Regarding combative ability, the Sith troopers have consistently torn through Jedi Knights and traitorous Sith warriors and seemed to legitimately scare Roan Fell with the purity of their hatred. That said, the Sith Troopers have also been depicted losing to several members of the main legacy cast, such as Cade and Shado Veo, suggesting that they likely capped out at around master level in strength. Nat Skywalker, as an old man, fought loads of these guys and was the last Jedi standing beside his favorite nephew, with whom he could keep pace. Imagine if your old uncle got jumped by six Aela Securas and not only survived, but one. You can probably see why Nat isn't one to be taken lightly. Speaking of those you don't want to trifle with, while this is mainly based on supposition, I can see a prime Nat Skywalker being comparable to Mara Jade Skywalker due to their implicitly similar standings in the lore. Alright, now we're getting into the real heavy hitters of this bloodline. In C tier, we have the Jedi Grand Master, Cole Skywalker. I have a How Powerful Was video that explains Cole's combative abilities in much greater depth that I highly recommend you check out, but I will, of course, be reiterating the broad points. As mentioned previously, Cole was stated by his older brother Nat to have been stronger than him even when the old Bantha had been in his prime, automatically placing him above D tier. This placement is corroborated by various guides confirming Cole Skywalker as the leader of his era's Jedi Council, as well as his close friend Nai Rin proclaiming him to have been the new Jedi Order's greatest warrior of the era. Though we admittedly do not know the names or abilities of every single Jedi the Grand Master served alongside before his death, this statement does place Skywalker's fighting ability well beyond the typical NJO Council standard, logically surpassing beings like Kukruk, Trasa, and Tilly Quay. For reference, a much weaker incarnation of Kukruk could throw hands with post-Dooku training Quinlan Voss and briefly hold his ground against Asajj Ventress. These praises of Cole were not just limited to the Jedi or Vong, as Darth Krayt also referred to him as having been an esteemed foe, implying that the Emperor viewed the Grand Master as a legitimate threat to him, Krayt being stronger than any other Sith that made up his order despite certain stages of his illness. In terms of his ethereal moveset, Cole Skywalker has sadly demonstrated very little, mainly due to his sparse appearances rather than any lack of ability. Physical augmentation, telekinesis, telepathy, he's got it all. Again, I go into more depth in the HPW video, but there is a strong narrative implication that the Grand Master is either capable of utilizing the Shatterpoint ability, or at least possesses some understanding of its principles. As I think we all know by now, Shatterpoint is one of the most OP powers a Force wielder can attain, with even baseline applications being known to grant considerable benefits. Speaking of rare powers, Cole's most noteworthy achievement as a Force wielder was his ability to transcend the physical plane as a Force spirit, being one of only five, possibly three, known Bloodborne Skywalkers to have successfully achieved the Sacred State. During the Osis Jedi Temple Massacre, Cole Skywalker would make a heroic last stand against the Dark Side forces to buy his students enough time to escape. Despite being no doubt fatigued by Force knows how many hours of battle, Cole slaughtered entire torrents of enemies like they were nothing. In the end, the Jedi Master stood atop a mountain of bodies estimated to consist of roughly 12 stormtroopers and 13 Sith warriors, a more impressive feat than anything Leia has ever done without assistance, before a surprise barrage of Sith lightning in the back from a critically injured Darth Nile finally took him down. Speaking of the nefarious Nagi, Cole would literally speed blitz Nile shortly after the Sith Lord had decimated Wolf Sazen. 
As noted by multiple sources, Nile was essentially the third strongest Darksider in the entire One Sith Order. He is relative or stronger than Darth Talon, one of the greatest duelists in the history of the One Sith, and he was able to contend briefly with End of Volume 3 Cade Skywalker. These accolades alone make Cole's ability to one-shot Nile insane, but there's another way of looking at this feat that really helps to put the Grand Master into perspective. One that I never even considered until I started doing research for this video. During the final arc of the Legacy comics, Darth Nile casually reacts to and dominates the mind of a fully grown Tukata beast in the tombs of Korriban. 158 years earlier, a less mature Tukata was shown keeping pace with and even injuring Anakin Skywalker one year before the Clone Wars. If we follow this assessment to its logical conclusion, this would mean that a fatigued Cole Skywalker might unironically be able to speed blitz Attack of the Clones Anakin Skywalker. Something I would just like to point out even Count Dooku couldn't do. You could say I'm reaching with this one, and you'd be right. However, it's not actually that outlandish considering that fully mature Tukata have even given beings like Book 1 Darth Bane and pre-Attack of the Clones Obi-Wan Kenobi some pushback. The ancient Sith did explicitly breed them to guard their tombs, after all. Even if you want to disregard the Tukata scaling, it's pretty apparent that peak Cole Skywalker is far stronger than Darth Nile whom Cade even mockingly points out needed a small army backing him up just to challenge his father. Before we move on, I want to make it clear that Cole Skywalker could easily qualify for higher rankings on this list if there was more information on him to draw from. While Cade was shown killing his father in a Dark Force vision, like with Nat, this display is more implicit in its implications rather than factual. Additionally, depending on how you interpret Krait's statements, a case could be made that the Legacy Grand Master exceeds the Dark Lord's pre-resurrection state, which, again, depending on interpretation, would place him much higher. The issue is that this is all just theorizing, and while I'm okay with supporting theories, even I have my limits. As it stands, Cole Skywalker needs more feats to place him higher on this list with any degree of confidence, though I will be going over a hypothetical highballed Cole later. Next in B tier, we have the Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker, later known as the Sith Lord Darth Vader, and his descendant Cade Skywalker, the former Padawan turned Jedi Crusader. Anakin Skywalker's accolades and feats pretty much speak for themselves. A virgin birth seemingly conceived by the Force itself, he was the prodigal chosen one destined to undo the damage wrought to the all-encompassing energy field during his era. As noted by numerous sources, Anakin's Force potential was greater than any who had come before him in the Old Jedi Order's 25,000 year history. Grandmaster Yoda considered the young knight more powerful than any Jedi he had ever known in his nearly 900-year lifespan, and Darth Sidious, the then strongest Sith in the Rule of Two, has stated point-blank that the young man could grow to surpass him. During the Mortis arc of TCW, we get a glimpse of the depths of Skywalker's latent strength when he subdues both the son and the daughter, who are the literal physical avatars of the dark and light sides of the Force, a feat that is arguably more impressive than anything anyone on this list has ever done. All that being said, this is all in reference to what the Chosen One could have been as opposed to what he actually was, though pre-peak Anakin is still a freaking beast. During the initial events of Revenge of the Sith, Anakin Skywalker defeated Count Dooku, a Sith Master who rivaled Mace Windu and Yoda. Following his corruption to the dark side of the Force and subsequent transformation into Darth Vader, Anakin would become substantially more powerful defeating the various masters stationed at the Jedi Temple during Operation Nightfall, such as Sin Drolig and Shakti, with mid-levels of difficulty at most. The fallen Jedi would later face his former master Obi-Wan Kenobi on Mustafar, and though defeated, both men were nerfed at the time due to their mental states, so it's pretty unquantifiable. 
After being rebuilt into the towering black armored behemoth we all know and fear, Anakin Skywalker's perspective on the Force would take on an entirely different form. While there is some contradictory information, I'm just going to be blunt and say that original trilogy Darth Vader kicks the crap out of prequel trilogy Anakin Skywalker. While it is inarguable that the injuries the Dark Lord suffered on Mustafar limited him in specific ways, there is far more evidence in the lore placing Vader above Anakin rather than the inverse. During the Dark Times, Nick Rostu stated that Vader's raw power was greater than that of the Lore Pelic Carvastor, with the young Corrin believing that a hypothetical fight between the two wouldn't even be close. For reference, Car Vastor was stated by Mace Windu during the Clone Wars to have been stronger than himself and possessed a raw force connection on the scale of Yoda and Anakin. A few weeks before the events of A New Hope, Darth Vader would fight and kill a doppelganger of Darth Maul created by a sect of the Prophets of the Dark Side. This doppelganger was confirmed by the author of the comic to have had specialized prep time and a massive power boost from the Prophets, yet still lost. Though the exact degree of the power boost is unclear, this doppelganger could be anywhere from Dooku level to possibly even higher depending on where you scale the real Darth Maul. Vader would go on to battle Ben Kenobi in a high diff fight aboard the first Death Star and once again come out on top. While OT Kenobi's scaling compared to his relative to Anakin prequel self is similarly murky to Vader's, there is a bit more evidence implying that old Ben's powers are comparable if not stronger than they were when he was young rather than the inverse. This might seem like an odd statement to make considering Vader initially calls Ben weak, however this was clearly intended as a taunt, and Vader even admits after their fight in the New Hope Jr. novelization that he had been wrong in assuming Obi-Wan's strength had diminished over time. Years would pass and Darth Vader's powers would continue to grow. By the time of Return of the Jedi, Vader was considered one of the most powerful Sith Masters to have ever existed, with the Dreadlord stating that his powers in the Dark Side of the Force were greater than they ever had been. This would obviously include his Nightfall and Mustafar selves when his journey down the Sith path initially began. During an interview with Vanity Fair magazine, George Lucas stated that Vader's raw power during the events of Return of the Jedi was equivalent to that of 80% the power level of Darth Sidious. While Sidious's power creep in between the prequel and original trilogies is difficult to pin down since he doesn't take part in many high diff fights, it has been confirmed that he did get stronger. Even if we assume that Sidious only got 20 to 30% more powerful between trilogies, which let's be honest, it's likely a lot higher than that, this would still place Darth Vader's raw power well above the characters featured in the prequels. So yeah, Darth Vader is superior to Anakin Skywalker in fighter ranking. Regarding familial scaling, Darth Vader has a much more in-depth combative lore than Cole Skywalker, and has defeated foes that would make relatively short work of Anakin Solo and Ben Skywalker. Leia's scaling is admittedly less clear-cut, however Luke stated in the book Dark Tide 2 Rune that he had seen greater displays of the Force and swordsmanship than the ones showcased by a weakened Mara Jade and Corrin Horn during their spar. At this point in the story, Vader could still be counted amongst Luke's strongest foes, meaning that the Jedi Master might have considered his father to have been stronger than mid Vong War Mara and Korin, who are, of course, above Leia. There is a tiny bit of direct evidence in support of this, considering that the Jedi Knight Clint Feige viewed Korin Horn as a fabled swordsman along the same lines of Anakin Skywalker. Leia might have gotten stronger after the Vong War, but again, she is shown struggling with foes with blatantly inferior showings to her father. Many have used Vader's loss to Luke in Episode 6 as a rebuttal to him being high NJO tier. However, it is stated in both the film and an innumerable amount of supplementary material that Vader's inner conflict heavily nerfed him in that engagement. Luke even states that his father would have killed him had he been trying to do so four years after his passing. It is not until the events of Dark Empire that Luke is implied to have reached a level of strength semi-comparable to Darth Vader. 
This is the same Luke whose movements Leia couldn't even perceive, let alone replicate, despite the two being mind-synced at the time. Cade Skywalker scaling to Darth Vader and the rest of his clan requires a bit more twisting, but is nonetheless definable. As mentioned, Cade was shown killing his uncle and father in various dark visions. We obviously shouldn't take these dreams as direct confirmation of anything, but Pete Cade still has a much more solid basis in the lore than Cole, and was the last Jedi standing alongside Nat at the Hidden Temple. You can even argue that Cade did better than his uncle in that fight due to his superior stamina and hacks, which we will get to shortly. Many would be quick to point out how Anakin slash Vader's force ghost stomped Cade during their interaction. However, this was a realm that the Chosen One had complete control of, and it was a Cade who hadn't even begun his retraining. So, not exactly a fair contest. Regarding power, Cade Skywalker was noted throughout the Legacy comics and their tie-in material to be immensely strong in the Force, even by the Skywalker standard. Although there aren't any notable examples of direct scaling in regards to the young man's power, Ghost Luke Skywalker, Kakruk, and Wolf Sazen have all referred to Cade as a very powerful individual in both aptitude and manifestation. Similar assertions have been made by Ghost Karnas Mur, Darth Krayt, and Darth Talon, all three of which the Crusader defeated to various degrees. The Murr praise is of particular notoriety here for several reasons. Murr's assessment of Vector Cade was very similar to the one he used to describe Dark Times Darth Vader, suggesting that the ancient Sith viewed the two men as equally worthy of the power embedded in his talisman. Speaking of the amulet, Cade casually resists and overpowers Karnas Murr's attempts to possess him after he kills Celest Moore at her request. In contrast, Vader is implied narratively to have been incapable of overcoming the amulet's power had he been successful in taking it, suggesting that Vector Arc Cade was stronger, at least mentally, than early Dark Times Vader. This is roughly the same Vader from the Carvastor slash Anakin scaling I mentioned previously. Yeah. In terms of abilities, Cade Skywalker can employ a myriad of exotic force powers stemming from both alignments of the force, such as beast control, force lightning, and even the potent Shatterpoint ability. The young man is most well known for his Dark Transfer ability, an extremely rare hybrid power that mixed Shatterpoint's internal perception with force lightning's energy channeling and force healing's precise alteration. This combo granted Cade a near-unbounded ability to heal or destroy other sentients by manipulating their internal structure, meaning he could theoretically death-touch anyone on this list given the right circumstances. Like his ancestors before him, Cade would grow immensely more powerful over the course of his story, to the point where he could defeat Darth Talon, who's relative to Darth Nile, without receiving any noticeable damage. He even briefly engaged Luke Skywalker's Force Ghost during one of their many heated conversations. While Luke was obviously in no real danger of being destroyed, fighting his Spectre and lasting longer than a Plank instant is not a feat I believe many other Jedi could lay claim to. At the climax of his era's Great War, Cade Skywalker would battle post-resurrection Darth Krayt atop the Sith Temple. Although he was initially bested, with victory only coming about through catching the Emperor off guard, Cade still had an equal, if not better, performance than Darth Weirlock III, who had previously stomped Darth Endedu. Making this showing all the more incredible is the fact that Krayt, at this point, should, at the very least, rival how he was back at the Lake of Apparitions, which was implied to be comparable to a prime Luke Skywalker. Standing tall in A tier, we have the Jedi Knight Jason Solo, later known as the Sith Lord Darth Kytus, and his older twin sister, the Jedi Master Jaina Solo Fell, also known as the Sword of the Jedi. Once again, these are two characters whose accolades and feats are fairly self evident. In terms of potential, Jason and Jaina may not have been quite the equals of their younger brother Anakin, however, they were still two of the greatest adepts to have ever been born. 
Their presence in the Force as freaking babies was sufficient to shock and amaze a Thrawn-era Luke Skywalker when he attempted to gauge them. Some sources have even implied that the two inherited depths of power directly equivalent to their mother, uncle, and grandfather, but I will unpack that later. Much like Luke and Leia, Jason and Jaina possessed an equal degree of aptitude, yet were primarily differentiated in expression rather than ability. The brother was very Yoda-like, channeling his energies into the ethereal side of things, whereas the sister had much more in common with Mace Windu, i.e. responding to a foe's lit lightsaber with her own. During the Vong War, the Solo children were considered the strongest non-council Jedi of their generation, surpassing all of their peers, even the abnormally powerful ones like Ganner Rydaso. During the liberation of Coruscant, the two would accompany their uncle into Supreme Overlord Shimra's citadel for the final battle. It would be from within these chambers that Jason would attain true oneness with the Force and finally put an end to the invaders' dreams of conquest. As the galaxy healed, Jason would spend the next five years traversing the stars, intent on learning everything about the Force he possibly could. Not only did this journey massively boost Jason's power level, but he also gained knowledge of many esoteric abilities from organizations outside the Jedi and Sith Orders, such as Theron Force Listening, the Baron Doe on Yosef Technique, and the Ang T Monk's Flow Walking. By the time of his return, Jason Solo was thought to have surpassed all the mainline members of the Jedi Council and was slowly encroaching on Luke Skywalker's level. In keeping with his grandfather's example, Jason's strength would take on an entirely new definition upon embracing the dark side, Darth Kytus being stated to be the most powerful of the Sith Lords. While this statement is vague, there is evidence to suggest that it does, at the very least, refer to all of the Dark Lords who previously comprised the Rule of Two. As noted by the official publisher's summary of Legacy of the Force Invincible, Darth Kytus at his peak was stronger than Darth Vader. Add this to the previous Most Powerful Sith accolade, and Kytus is not only confirmed stronger than prequel Anakin Skywalker, but also beings like Darth Sidious, Darth Plagueis, and Count Dooku. He would also logically exceed every Darksider who operated during his era, such as Lumaya, Gavrakai, and pre-prime Darth Krait. During the Second Galactic Civil War, Kytus would battle Ben Skywalker, Mara Jade Skywalker, and Kyle Katarn, and best all of them with varying degrees of difficulty. The Sith Master would also engage Luke Skywalker in Legacy of the Force Inferno, and though defeated, it was an extremely difficult fight for all those involved. Leaving a Jedi Grand Master of such caliber a bloody mess is nothing to ignore. Luke would later peer into the future in order to gauge whether or not he could face his nephew again. He concluded that he would still win, but not without serious risk of losing himself to darkness. Again, not exactly an unsubstantial accolade. Jaina's solo scaling is slightly less fleshed out than Darth Kytus's, but is similarly direct in its layout. As mentioned, despite being marginally weaker than her uncle and brother during the Vong War, she was still an absolute powerhouse, defeating War Master Savong La despite being injured, and standing her ground against a holding back Kip Duran. After the war, Solo would spend years breaking the backs of various crime rings that attempted to take advantage of the post-invasion carnage, growing much stronger as a result. It would not be until after Kytus had returned from his Galaxy Force quest and fallen to darkness that any major gap between the siblings would become apparent. Realizing she would need to hone her existing skills as well as gain new ones, Jaina would spend multiple books training with both the Jedi and the Mandalorians, mastering the Shatterpoint ability and the deadly Beskad Saber. Jaina fought Darth Kytus on two separate occasions and defeated him in each. However, during the first fight, Jaina was amped by Luke's battle meditation, which enabled her to slice off Kytus' left arm at the elbow. The second fight was a bit more even, although Jaina did manage to somewhat surprise Kytus with a stab to the gut at its initiation. 
While both siblings were shown to have been nerfed due to their mental states, unlike Anakin and Obi-Wan, you could argue that the Solo's respective levels of impairment weren't equivalent due to Kytus' added fear for the life of his daughter, Alana. Despite all these disadvantages, Darth Kytus still gave Jaina Solo an extremely difficult fight that left them both absolutely wrecked, strongly implying that he would have won had he been completely healthy. Fortunately, Jaina Solo Fell would have three additional years of power grinding leading into the events of the Fate of the Jedi books. During the war with Abeloth and the Lost Tribe of the Sith, Jaina was stated by Luke to have grown to be the combat equal of anyone in the Order. While this is a vague designation, it is more than likely that Luke considered his niece capable of standing on relatively equal footing with any living Jedi. This statement is nearly identical to the praise given to post-Journey Jason since the word anyone would logically include all 11 Council Masters and Luke himself. Add this to the fact that Jaina was granted a seat on the Jedi Council in the final book, and I believe it is reasonable to assume that the Sword of the Jedi had closed the gap between her and Kytus enough to warrant placing them on the same tier. All that being said, Jaina Solo Fell still admitted during Fate of the Jedi that her uncle Luke was more powerful than her, which is understandable since, like with Kytus, she was still working towards her peak when her story was erased. Before we continue, this is where Cole Skywalker could potentially go depending on how far you want to take the implications of his story, accolades, and showings. If you go full force on him as this legendary Jedi Grandmaster who was above pre-resurrection crate and end of series Cade, and was running on only 30% HP when he one-shot Darth Nile, I can see the argument for him as an A-tier fighter. Of course, this is only if you highball him based on conjecture around his lore, rather than directly evaluating his feats. Shocking absolutely no one, in S tier of the Skywalker family, we have the Jedi Grandmaster Luke Skywalker, also known as the hero by those who fear him, and the farm boy by those who love him. Luke's legacy of power is one that is notable even outside the Star Wars franchise. Just type in Luke Skywalker vs. blank and you'll find results well into the millions. Luke's power potential was stated numerous times to have surpassed all the Jedi of the Old Order, with Vader believing that his son's raw connection to the Force was greater than even Anakin Skywalker's. This belief is corroborated by various statements from George Lucas expressing his view that Luke could not only equal his father's full potential, but possibly surpass it. Having trained under two of the greatest Jedi Masters in galactic history, as well as martial artists on over 20 different worlds, Luke Skywalker would progress quickly as a Jedi despite his iconically rocky start. During the events of ROTJ, Skywalker would defeat Darth Vader aboard the second Death Star, albeit thanks to his father's inner conflict. Honing his skills over the preceding years, the young man would grow to become a Jedi of the highest order by the time frame of Dark Empire, who would go on to defeat the most powerful version of Darth Sidious with the help of his sister. During the Yuuzhan Vong invasion, Skywalker was referred to as the most powerful Jedi in the galaxy, which would obviously include the various Solos and his fellow NJO Council Masters. When the Second Galactic Civil War was raging throughout the stars, Luke would defeat Lumaya and Darth Kytus in extremely difficult fights, the latter of whom, as mentioned, being a Sith Lord confirmed stronger than both Darth Vader and Darth Sidious. The Grand Master would continue to be referred to as the strongest living Jedi in the galaxy by his niece and others in the era of FOTJ, with Vestari Kai claiming that Luke possesses more power than anyone she could think of despite having already tangled with one of Abeloth's host bodies. Speaking of the Chaos Bringer, Luke would engage her on several occasions despite admitting that her power exceeded his a dozen times over. That being said, the fact that this gap was merely in the double-digit multipliers as opposed to the septuple-digit multipliers is pretty notable since Abeloth was a creature of a similar tier to the ones of Mortis. Luke would eventually defeat Abeloth within a force realm known as the Lake of Apparitions with the aid of Darth Krait and his fellow Jedi. 
Luke Skywalker, much like Superman, is also a character who constantly holds back for fear of losing himself to his inner emotions, meaning that the true upper limits of the Grand Master's powers might have yet to be fully displayed. While we're on the topic of theoretical upscaling, S-tier is where I think you could rank a hypothetical full potential Anakin Solo and Ben Skywalker. Anakin was stated to have possessed greater aptitude than either of his older siblings, and was originally intended to have been Luke's successor before his mandated death. Meanwhile, Ben has showcased a higher growth rate than Jason or Jaina, with Kytus stating that his cousin could surpass him with time. With all that considered, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that a hypothetical peak Anakin Solo and Ben Skywalker would at least be comparable to a Fate of the Jedi Grandmaster Luke Skywalker. You could also throw Cade Skywalker in here, depending on how you interpret his lore, and how far removed you think he was from his peak by the end of the comic, though like with his dad, it is purely conjecture. Last but certainly not least, we have the hypothetical S-tier plus. In this category, we have full potential Anakin Skywalker, full potential Luke Skywalker, and full potential Leia Organa Solo. I was going to save a discussion on the full potential Skywalkers for its own video, and I still might make it one day, but let's get into it here. The debate surrounding the Skywalker's so-called potential pool is one of the oldest and most prolific discussions in the entire Star Wars fandom. This is because the lore itself is inconsistent on how exactly the Skywalker bloodline's power is distributed. That said, much like with prequel Anakin versus original trilogy Vader, there is more evidence pointing in one direction over another. Looking at it purely as is, with all the lore and statements considered, Luke and Leia either have equal force potential to Anakin or exceed him by a hair. Allow me to explain. As I've stated many times in this video, Anakin possessed a greater aptitude with the force than anyone who had come before him, with Darth Vader, even at his peak, being incapable of reaching the power heights his former self could have. During the Mortis trilogy, Anakin briefly unlocks his full power by merging his spirit with the Force Dimensional Plane. With his newfound strength, the Chosen One simultaneously dominated the son and the daughter in their bestial states. This feat is more impressive than anything Luke or Leia have ever done since all of the ones were stated to be more powerful than Abeloth, whose strength exceeded Luke's by a factor of 12. This may seem odd considering the son and the daughter were shown to be afraid of Abeloth and needed to be saved by their father, who, in his prime, was the strongest of the entire celestial race. However, given the story context surrounding the flashback and the various supplemental info, it's likely that the son and daughter were simply nerfed due to their love for their surrogate mother and the gruesomeness of her sudden transformation. I can't speak for everyone, but I know if my mother suddenly started looking like this, I know I would be more than a bit unbalanced. So essentially, Anakin Skywalker at his fully realized Mortis enhanced potential can overpower beings marginally stronger than someone magnitudes above Fate of the Jedi Luke and Leia. However, I don't necessarily view this feat as a definitive sign of full potential Anakin's superiority because it only applies to the Chosen One while he is on Mortis, and when it is specifically scaled against non-full potential versions of Luke and Leia. As I mentioned previously, Darth Vader believed that Luke Skywalker's connection to the Force was possibly even greater than Anakin Skywalker's. Considering what Anakin went through on Mortis, I see little reason to assume that Vader would be incapable of accurately gauging his own inner power. Before he even learned of their survival, Vader was depicted lamenting how an offspring between him and Padme would have undoubtedly produced an immensely powerful individual, one he thought could have had force strength beyond measure. Darth Sidious is also someone who has frequently expressed a deep understanding of Anakin's potential, yet did not even so much as hesitate in asserting that Luke could rise to equal or greater heights. 
If that wasn't enough, George Lucas has stated in multiple interviews that Luke could be just as powerful as Anakin could have been. At one point, he even refers to the farm boy in classic Lucas fashion as a more primo version of his father, which implies that he might even consider Luke's potential power to be greater than Anakin's. As for Leia Organa Solo, she is stated repeatedly to possess potential directly equivalent to her twin. Again, the only difference was the orientation of her focus. If she had committed herself completely to the Jedi way from the moment she learned of her heritage, she could have been everything her brother was. Her moveset might have been a little different, but her raw ability would have still been the same. As mentioned, Kip Duran regarded Leia's natural force connection as equal to his, and Kip has been confirmed to be on a similar level to Luke. Furthermore, Jason and Jaina's entry in the official Star Wars fact file states that they both inherited the Skywalker Force powers, implying that the same Force energies that flowed from Anakin to Luke also flowed from Anakin to Leia. While some have taken this statement to suggest that the Skywalker potential pool decreases with every generation, not only has that never been stated, but the lore blatantly contradicts it. In reality, the Skywalker's potential appeared to follow an ebb and flow pattern from person to person rather than a downward spiral. Otherwise, we wouldn't have cases like Anakin Solo, who has greater potential than his siblings, or Nat Skywalker, who has less. We also wouldn't have cases like Mara Saya Fell being leagues below Cade Skywalker, despite the two technically being very distant cousins. At the end of the day, the breakdown basically goes like this when it comes to the S tier plus rankings of the full potential Skywalkers. Anakin has been shown pulling off a feat more significant than anything his family has ever done before or since. However, this was an amped feat that he can't achieve on his own that the lore both in and out of universe makes clear is within his children's possible purview. When looked at objectively, full potential realized Luke Skywalker and Leia Organa Solo are, at worst, equal to full potential realized Anakin Skywalker and are, at best, slightly above him. The ultimate test of this fabled debate would be a hypothetical three-way all-out battle between ROTS Anakin and FOTJ Luke and Leia on Mortis with all of them drawing their potentials out to the fullest. In that instance, I would still put my credits on Luke, since at that point, power would be a complete non-factor, and victory would come down to matters of skill and variety, both of which he has over his father and his sister. However, since such a conflict would likely result in the destruction of the entire Star Wars multiverse, maybe it's best to keep things in the realm of speculation. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown and ranking of the Skywalker family. This one will probably lead to many discussions, so I'm excited to see what you all have to say. As always, leave any thoughts or questions in the comment section below. May the Force be with you, stay safe, and I'll see you guys later.